Have you ever been told that your joint was bone on bone and someone described your disease as wear and tear or degenerative? As a consequence, were you fearful to move because of concerns that that might lead to further injury or pain? Did those beliefs affect your enthusiasm for moving more to take better care of yourself and those around you? Did you end up resting more, eating for comfort, and your health declining? Today, we are here to challenge those beliefs and the consequent behaviors. As we have said on this podcast before, physical activity and exercise are beneficial and safe for people with osteoarthritis. But despite extensive research supporting that, nine out of 10 people with osteoarthritis are inactive. Oftentimes because of beliefs around physical activity further damaging the joint that are unhelpful and have negative impacts on the uptake of treatments like exercise and physical activity. Hello, it's David Hunter. And on this week's episode of Joint Action, we're joined by Tasha Stanton to discuss reframing pain in the context of osteoarthritis. The main purpose of today's chat is to help you reconceptualize what pain means and shift from that dialogue from pain being solely a marker of tissue damage, but also discuss the important nervous system and other adaptations that occur in osteoarthritis and as pain persists. We also discuss education programs that target that knowledge and the beliefs that might underlie your behaviors that detract from your ability to be physically active and to modify your behavior. Hello, Tash, and welcome to the show. Hi, David. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Really looking forward to this conversation, and I think it's going to be incredibly valuable. So before we get into the main topic and content of what we're really wanting to focus on today, I'm just wondering if you could just tell everybody a little bit about what you do on a regular basis through the day. Yeah, sure. So basically, I work as a researcher at the University of South Australia. So my day often involves engaging in different research activities. And I originally trained as a, as a physiotherapist, but now really work in the area of what we would term pain science. So understanding, you know, why we have pain and why for some people it's worse than others and why it doesn't go away. My day typically frames around, you know, trying my best to get up early, go for a run, get some creative juices going. And then I'll often go in to the office and meet with students that I'm supervising that are doing really interesting and innovative projects, trying to understand pain in various different health conditions. I might be writing some grants, I might be writing some papers, but ultimately I feel like with the aim of what I'm trying to do most days is to get a little bit of window of time to connect with some ideas that I think are important and I think that would be valuable for the field of pain to move it forward and to understand new treatments. Great, great description. I might just probe a couple of those things. So when you say window of time, is that during the day at work or is that during your run in the morning? It's interesting because I often find that I do my best thinking when I'm running. So when I'm engaging sort of your motor system and you're moving, it sort of frees my brain and allows me to kind of think outside of the box. So I really actually value that time for pondering questions that I'm interested in, trying to solve different problems that I might be stuck on. But then I've, I've started to become a bit purposeful to not sort of get caught up in all of the different administrative tasks that we often do get caught up with in academia, but to block out an hour or so, if I can, each day to just focus on something where I'm thinking quite deeply. Yeah, that's no, really, really helpful. And I'm obviously being incredibly selfish in, in probing a little bit here. How successful are you in blocking that time? Yeah, that's a very good question. Some weeks, terrible. So I do find whenever I'm, you know, writing big grants, which is obviously trying to get funding for projects that we think are really important. I find those weeks are really hard because you're working on the very nitty gritty details often of those grants that just eat up a whole day. 
But I would say probably on average, if I think about over a month, I'd say about 50% of the time I'm good at doing that. Well, kudos to you. I hope you're able to keep it going. (laughs) And when you're not getting those creative juices going at work, what do you like doing outside of work? Yeah, so I'm a big nature nut. I love hiking, you know, basically anything that takes me outside, going for nice walks or for runs. I am also a a very big lover of wine. So I live in the right place. I live in Adelaide where whatever direction you go, we have a a wine region there. (laughs) And then what I think people may not know is I'm a very avid karaoke fan. Notably, I'm not good, but I'm very enthusiastic. And I feel like that counts. Do you think inside yourself that you're good or it's more just you enjoy doing it? No, no? I'm terrible. <laughs> or you've recorded it and listened to yourself? I try to avoid that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So let's dig into the content of today, which is obviously really talking about reframing pain. Before we get into looking at pain beliefs and how you might reguide and reframe some of those, What are some of the common pain beliefs in people with osteoarthritis? Yeah, there are quite a few actually, and they're very pervasive. So one of the most common ones that people will have heard, and and many people who don't have osteoarthritis will have heard of, is the idea that osteoarthritis is this bone on bone disease. It's painful because everything's bone on bone, and it's a wear and tear disease of the joint. It involves things like, you know, degeneration, changes, pathology. Those tend to be quite strongly held beliefs in people with osteoarthritis that the pain that I'm feeling is because I don't have any cartilage left and everything is bone on bone. And from the perspective of the people that you see, is that coming to them from their lay friends? Is it coming to them from the medical profession? Is it coming to them from other health professionals? Where where does that perception come from about the description that you just said of bone on bone? I think you know, it did originate from health professionals. So that actually is language that we very commonly hear health professionals use, but generally as a society, when we read things about osteoarthritis, very often we'll hear about wear and tear or a degenerative disease, which kind of relates to this idea of wear and tear. So I think actually it is coming from quite a few different sources. And particularly, I think when you have medical professionals that are using this type of language, and I include, you know, doctors, you might have surgeons, you have allied health professionals, like what physiotherapists are as well. I think that medical reinforcement of that type of terminology, it makes those beliefs very strong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and as you say, I think they've been pervasive for many years. And changing that will be an effort in and of itself. But if we were to change it, what types of terms would you think are more appropriate to use? And I guess a follow on from that question, how should we go about changing that from the originators of those descriptors, whether they be medical professionals or otherwise? Yeah, oh, it's a great question. So instead of saying things like wear and tear, I actually think a more accurate thing to say is wear and repair or load and grow. Because what we see from the scientific evidence is that actually cartilage is a dynamic thing. And that when we load it, when we put force through it appropriately, actually it can change and it can become healthy. Something I don't think that's actually very well understood or even known. If I think of other terms like bone on bone, I think we just should just throw that out altogether because I mean, when we think about the anatomy of the knee, what's what it's actually made up of, we know that actually you have beautiful, luscious, lubricating fluid in there. You have something called synovial fluid. And part of that is called lubricin. And it is one of the slipperiest things known to humankind. And that's always there in the joint. So I think some of those narratives, it's really helpful to try to shift that to more accurate terms that actually aren't so scary to hear. And I'd say for the last one, we often hear these things called degenerative changes or joint degeneration. If we look into the literature in this area, we often see that many of these changes that we might see in the joint, they actually occur regardless of whether people have pain. 
So taking people, no previous injury, no knee pain at all, we chuck them into the scanner. We see that for many of them, 40% of them will have evidence of so-called osteoarthritis changes on scan. So I'd say we don't call them degenerative changes. We call them age-related changes or age-related adaptations. So how do we go about changing the dialogue? Because obviously you're at the forefront of the damaging consequences of some of the beliefs that, that occur to patients who hear this terminology. But you know, how do we stem the continued dialogue in clinical care? I think it has to be multifaceted. So it has to you know, work via numerous strategies. I think one of the key ways is working directly with people who do have osteoarthritis and provide that information to them that here's what we actually understand from the most recent science that, you know, the evidence doesn't suggest that it's just a disease of your joint. Rather, it suggests that osteoarthritis is a whole body process that involves low levels of inflammation. And there's actually lots that you can do to alter or change low levels of inflammation and improve things. So I think that First of all, having that knowledge and providing that knowledge to people with with osteoarthritis is very important, but we do need to target medical professionals. So we do this by professional lectures. We do this by giving continuing education, but I think we really need to instigate some of these within medical training programs and allied health training programs so that as people are coming through, they're coming through with the right understanding. We're not having to change it. We're just getting it right in the first place. And then I think probably what would be really important and actually some work that one of my postdocs is doing is looking at mass media type campaigns. Because I think, as you mentioned it before, is there's this pervasive, long lasting idea that exists within society that this is what osteoarthritis is. And I think ultimately that does require a bigger target. Yeah, no, I think we definitely need to get out as the mainstream and whether that be through through billboards or social media or, or standard media advertising, that'd be really interesting work. So really keen to see where that goes, Tash. Now, obviously, the main focus of today is really talking to the community of people that have osteoarthritis and hopefully addressing some of the unhelpful beliefs that may have been instilled in them through the dialogue that we've just been speaking about. What consequences to those beliefs, does that terminology have on their acceptance of treatments that we would like to be advocating for? Yeah, I think it has an incredibly important influence because if we hold really strong beliefs that, you know, I have pain because I have no cartilage left and my bones are rubbing against each other and it's this degenerative disease that's just going to get worse over time, it makes absolutely no sense to exercise or to undertake activity. Because when we talk to people who do have osteoarthritis, they'll say things like, why would exercise make this any better? If it's a wearing out problem of my joints, why would doing more activity work? Wouldn't it make it worse? Or like, why is it important if I strengthen the muscles above and below my knee? If it's bone on bone, why would that help? And I think those are absolutely valid things to think. But when we begin to understand that osteoarthritis isn't just about the joint, that it has multiple complex contributing factors that includes things like inflammation levels that can occur due to higher levels of body weight, particularly body fat. It can include higher levels of inflammation due to diet, it can include changes to kind of the sensitivity of our pain system. And when we understand that there's actually multiple different contributing factors and that exercise and activity is actually one of the best things to give our systems a bit of a push, a bit of a a requirement to adapt and change, then it actually makes more sense why we might be saying, I actually think that you moving more is the most important thing for you to do. Yeah, that's a, a tremendously helpful explanation. And you're obviously focusing down a lot on this with some of the recent work that you've been doing around pain science education And you've started touching upon that already with the response to that last stem. But I'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit more on what that program actually covers in terms of challenging pain beliefs and changing, hopefully, behaviors that are a consequence of that. Sure. So this this idea of pain science education or education about osteoarthritis, what it involves is really exploring some of the newest scientific evidence that exists, but in a way that's really accessible. So it's exploring 
what happens in our body in terms of things like inflammation levels when we have you know, not a great diet and we're eating lots of processed foods, when we're not moving very much, when we might be carrying more weight than we'd like to, how does that change the way that our systems work? And that includes exploring things like the importance of our gut microbiome, because we're starting to hear more and more and understand more and more that your gut microbiome is incredibly complex and it communicates with your circulation. It talks to, to your blood <laughs> and it's able to release factors into there and influence basically how you feel. And the more inflammation you have, the more things hurt. It sensitizes your entire pain system. And that's really important to understand because then it starts to make more sense why, for example, let's say, you know, why should I be moving if my knee hurts when I do it? Well, if we understand that there's all these other different factors that are making your protective function, your protective system in your knee on high alert, then if we can actually remove some of those other factors, it will make things hurt less but also we don't have to be as worried if we're a bit sore when we're exercising because we're not anywhere near damaging the tissue. We're just kind of pushing into our, our safety buffer. So it's the pain science education program is exploring all of these kind of different concepts, these, this idea that we, we all have a unique safety buffer, which is basically how much and how quickly our system protects us by producing the experience of pain, and then working with people to say, what sort of factors are contributing to your safety buffer? What sort of things can we do and change? How can we slowly but surely increase the activity that you're doing and add in all these different changes that will be helpful for your unique situation to then be more fit, be able to do more activity and experience less pain while you're doing it? Superb. And I mean, it sounds sounds like a wonderful program. I know you're doing a trial on it at the moment, but can you just describe a little bit about how long an individual might take to be involved in that particular pain science education program and how intense that program is in terms of hours of commitment per week? And if there are any resources that people can tack on to that that are accessible, that'd be great to know about as well. Of course. Yeah. So how we have it set up in the moment in our trial is it's quite intensive education. So it involves four weeks of about an hour and a half sessions that involve both discussing different aspects of knee osteoarthritis, understanding your unique situation more directly, but then also bringing in graduated general increases in activity levels through things like walking. So that is about, you know, an hour and a half weekly for four weeks, followed then by telehealth sessions where your people are getting about a 20 minute follow up or so over another four weeks to check in and see how they're going. And then ideally having two more in person sessions later on to follow up to see if you need any more progressions in the activity program. But in a lot of aspects, what we've found in past work with pain science education is that it's quite helpful to have an intensive but personalized session so that you're able to ask the questions that come up. And that takes a bit of time. Like if you're told a lot of new information, you need to process that. You need to think about it and say, you know, that didn't make sense to me. Mm, what about this? And then in, engage in that discussion. So it's, I guess, more about that discussion of your unique situation in the new knowledge, rather than kind of just a clinician telling you all this stuff. It's really engaging in that, that discussion of, of what's relevant for you. Yeah. So, you know, that listening piece is obviously incredibly important there, as opposed to the standard dictatorial telling that many health professionals are well-trained in doing. Yeah, and we do have some resources with this now. So one of the groups that I do a lot of collaboration with is, is called Noi Group, and they're based out of Adelaide, and they're a pain education company, basically, service provider. So they have general books that are involved with, they term them explaining pain. So trying to understand how our system works and why that might explain, you know, weird pain symptoms that we have that might be actually quite concerning. But then when we understand that 
how our pain system works, it makes total sense why we're experiencing those things. And we've written a specific book for osteoarthritis that will be released, I think, either later this year or early next year. And so that's a resource that's specifically written to bring in this new knowledge about osteoarthritis and specifically written at a a personalized level for someone who does have osteoarthritis. Fantastic. So it sounds like there's a general resource with an osteoarthritis resource coming. And what Tash, what I'll probably get you to do, if you don't mind, is just send through a link and we can include that in the show notes. You bet. Anything else that we haven't touched upon that you think might be important for us to talk about and convey? Yeah, great question. I think I think one thing that is really relevant to understand is that sometimes it can seem really weird that we're focusing so much on education and talking about what osteoarthritis is and what pain is. Like, why are we doing that? You know, I'm seeing a physiotherapist, I should be exercising and that's all I'm here for, or maybe getting a massage. But I guess what I really want to convey is that actually that education is a key aspect. It's a treatment in and of itself. And when you engage in those processes and when you really think deeply and and challenge some of the things that you might have thought was were true and they were just fact the benefit of that is that changes the way that your system protects itself if i tell you that you need to be super worried about something and oh you're not sure if maybe you're going to be damaged in an experiment that i do you're going to get injured the exact same stimulus maybe a poke on the hand it will hurt more if you're feeling nervous or you're feeling scared. If you are feeling nervous or you're feeling scared that activity or exercise might damage your joint further, your system does the right thing and it protects you more. And so the same thing can hurt more, despite the fact that it's no difference in your joint or the activity, but when you're afraid or nervous, your system's doing what it's meant to do and it's protecting you. So I think understanding that your knowledge and your beliefs about your own condition can actually influence what you experience is an incredibly important thing to grasp because then it makes sense why we're yammering on so much about why it's important to understand. Yeah, tremendous summary. And I think a, a wonderful way for people hopefully to understand the importance of the work that you are doing and hopefully increase the number of people who are developing an interest in pain science behavior and hopefully changing some of the negative beliefs that are so pervasive in our community. I agree. And I think if I may add one last thing is I think a word that has not often been used in osteoarthritis, but that I think is very credible and is relevant to use is this idea of bioplasticity. It means changeability. And there's many times I think that people feel quite strongly that things are only going to get worse and that I'm just going to need to get surgery. And what we see from the evidence is that even in people who have severe osteoarthritis, we looked at the scan and it looks bad. There's evidence that they have bioplasticity. They have the ability to change and improve. And so just remembering that it's not necessarily that things are determined for you. Your future can be constructed. Yeah. Wonderful, positive message, because I think so many people are so inhibited about what they're planning and proposing to do based upon a picture that they can't unsee. So Tash, what I might do is just move on to the next segment, because hopefully people either have a wonderful understanding from all of the tremendous things that you've said, and or can dig into some of those resources that, that we will link to. But just in an effort to, I guess, probe your knowledge a little bit further, partly for selfish reasons, but hopefully also for the wonderful listeners who are out there, if you could do anything to improve health and healthcare, what would you do? Yeah, this is such a good question and a hard one. And I think I actually might answer a little tangentially to this, but I would actually like to make access to things like nature and beauty a human right. Our surroundings, they just can play such an enormous role in our health. And we know that context, the things around us, plays such a huge role in pain that we experience. And I just think of an example. So I grew up in Edmonton in Canada, and our city is just known for boxed, boring, cookie cutter square buildings. And they're so ugly. (laughs) And I just think that That's such a waste. When you have beauty around you, when you have nature around you, it can be inspirational. It can be calming. It can be grounding. All of these things that actually 
can really influence us much more than we might realize. So I sort of think that things like, I've got a sister-in-law who works in arts and creative sciences, and this idea of placemaking, of creating a common vision for spaces, working together with the people that will use them to create something that gives that feeling of community, that gives that feeling of function and acceptance, I actually think I would love to do that generally because I think our health outcomes would be so much better. Great, great suggestion. And, you know, follows tangentially on very well from a conversation that I'm hoping to have very soon about the built environment and one of the important social determinants there because it has a huge impact. Now, again, Tash, partly for selfish reasons, but also hopefully because I think a lot of a lot of the people who are listening may gain a lot from it. How do you continue to learn in order to stay on top of things? Yeah, it's a combination of things. I think talking to people tends to be, I find my preferred way of learning. So that could be research experts at conferences like you, or it can be people that I collaborate with in various different roles, because I think it's really hard. You can't, you don't have enough time to stay on top of everything. So I tend to probably use my personal relationships and connections with people to be like, you know, what are you excited about? Is there any way that we can work together on this? And then I think also quite critically is I've really, really enjoyed and had such value about talking directly to people who have that lived experience of pain. So we did this a little bit through an initiative that we we called Pain Revolution, where we took, you know, people were bike riding to rural and regional areas of Australia, but we also took something called the Brain Bus, where we drove it around to different communities and we talked to people that were there and explored with them what their challenges were, what they needed. And I just think learning from people who have that health condition about what they need rather than designing a research question about what I think they need, is so important. Yeah, so accurate, because I think a lot of researchers have an enormous propensity to get very abstract with what they think is critical. But I think when you go out and, I guess, reach out to those people, as you say, with a lived experience, the community of people that actually have the disease, you'll get a whole lot of different perspectives that are wholly so much more valuable. Absolutely. Now, Tash, my favorite question, but why do you do what you do? What's your motivation? Yeah, I'm, I reflect on this a lot, actually, especially when I have a lot of grants due. I'm like, why do I do what I do? <laughs> I think it's always a bad time to reflect on it, I tell you. Yeah, that's right. I think it comes down to like, I'm just a massive nerd and I'm so curious about why we experience the things that we do and why different people experience the same thing differently. It blows my mind. And so the fact that the human body and the brain and the nervous system are just so complex, that really fills me with wonder. (laughs) And so I guess getting to learn and getting to engage and be part of these cool new discoveries is amazing. And I think also from a personal aspect, I, I have an interest in pain because my mom had chronic pain and currently still has chronic pain. And speaking with her about her experiences and the way that she was treated, you know, back when she very first developed it and and by health professionals, it was really terrible, unfortunately. And I guess I just feel like if the only thing that my work does is to never have a person be told that pain is all in their head, but for that health practitioners that understand pain is real, whatever people are saying, it is real. You need to believe them. I would actually consider then my career to be a massive success. So I think I've got a curiosity motivating factor, but also, you know, kind of that empathic wanting to make that that world a better place. Well, I think you're well on the way to doing that already with a lot of the wonderful work that you're doing. And hopefully you can t- continue to do the same. But I think having that firm base where you're, uh, sounds like incredibly inquisitive is a great space to come from. Now, we, we touched upon this a little bit earlier, Tash, but I'm wondering whether you could expand on a little bit more. And this is when you were talking about your postdoc who's doing a little bit around the media space and hopefully personalizing a lot of the nonsensical scientific language that we tend to use. But if you could have a billboard with anything on it, and it doesn't need to be a billboard, it could be an advertisement. What types of messages do you think are critical to get out there? Yeah, I think coming back to to what we just spoke about, I think one of them I'd want to have is, I believe you, (laughs) is, you know, it would have relevance for so many people. It could be someone in pain. Your pain is real. I believe you. Because I think many times people don't feel heard. And 
subsequently, we don't feel believed. <laughs> and that sense that someone is on your side and believes you is there is enormously helpful. But I also think another billboard that I'd like to have would be, you know, change is always possible. And it brings back to that idea and that link to bioplasticity, because I think there's a tendency to think, oh, well, I'm getting old. I'm 70 and I've got osteoarthritis. It's only going to get worse from here. And that often actually can be the narrative that they might hear from a health practitioner that they see. Oh, well, it's a an older person's disease. You're inevitably going to get it. And this is what's going to happen. And I just think that change is always possible because we don't have evidence that bioplasticity or changeability stops the minute you hit retirement age. You are changeable down to the very last breath. It's all just about giving your system a push, a reason and a need to change. And I think that as health practitioners, that's where we play such an important role of helping to determine that educational push, that activity push, that diet push, all things that challenge our system and then require it to adapt. Such a positive message. And I might just hit replay on that so that everybody can listen to it on a regular basis because it's such such an important message because I think so many people are losing hope and potentially getting depressed or isolated as a consequence of the messages we're currently giving them. And so I think it's critical that they hear that there is an opportunity for change. And as you started out that particular response, hopefully someone who's also listening. And so Tash, in closing, is there any one piece of advice, knowledge or wisdom that you'd like to share? I think I would just say, Your journey is not determined. It is not inevitable that you will need surgery. Your future of osteoarthritis can be constructed. There are many things you can do to help and it can improve. And I think believing that deep down in your gut makes all the difference. Great way to close. Thank you, Tash, so much for all that you do, for the wonderful way you frame and hopefully reframe things for many people who are getting the wrong messages. And I hope you continue to do the wonderful work that you do. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. I'm so pleased that I could be on. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. I hope you found the conversation with Tash both informative and enjoyable. She definitely brings strong enthusiasm, intellectual curiosity, and passion to this incredibly important topic. If you've been told that you've got bone on bone changes, or that this is a wear and tear disease. We now know that there are lots of great ways to reframe that terminology, to reframe your understanding of this disease, and also hopefully reframe your pain experience and allow you to better engage in appropriate behaviors like exercise and physical activity. Thank you again so much for your support of the podcast. Really looking forward to engaging with you in the near future. And between now and then, please do take care of yourself. And if you have the chance, someone else as well. Thanks for listening to Joint Action with David Hunter. If you like our show and want to know more, visit www.jointaction.info. If you have any questions, you can email us at hello at jointaction.info and follow us on Twitter at jointactionorg. This podcast was hosted by David Hunter, edited by Vicky Duong, music produced by Jordan Hunter. The information posted on this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Anyone seeking medical advice should consult a health professional.